All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Castro. I'm director of the Center for Data Innovation. If you don't know the center, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank here in DC, focusing on the intersection of data technology and public policy. I'd like to welcome you to today's event, how the United States can maintain its lead in the global AI race. Uh, before we begin, just two points for logistics. First, the event is being recorded and live streamed. Um, if you're watching online, uh, we invite you to join the conversation using the hashtag data innovation on Twitter. Um, today we want to have a discussion about what it will take to lead the world in AI. The Center for Data Innovation recently released a comprehensive report assessing how the United States stacks up against China and the European Union when it comes to AI. The good news is that the United States has a very strong early lead in this area. The bad news is, of course, that many other countries, especially China, are making a big push to close this gap. Fortunately, we have some uh, incredibly smart and dedicated staff uh, in the White House and throughout the federal government working on U.S. policy and AI. Chief among those is Michael Kratzios, recently confirmed as the fourth U.S. Chief Technology Officer. Michael has shaped this administration's executive order on AI, which provides a multitude of options for directing federal resources, talent, and policy changes to ensure U.S. strength in the field. And yesterday, he chaired the discussion at the White House Summit on AI and government, where he outlined a vision for using AI to reduce cost, improve services, increase efficiency, and empower the American people. So we're delighted that he is here today to share some remarks about the many steps this administration is taking to support and maintain U.S. leadership in AI. Please join me in welcoming Michael Kratzios. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, for having me here. Um, you know, I want to I want to begin by thanking uh, ITIF, Rob, and everyone else um, for for hosting this. Uh, it really comes at a at a critical time for our nation's collective AI efforts. Now, as ITF's latest report shows, the United States holds the competitive edge in this field. This is not only a field that. America knows, it is, a, it is a field that actually Americans founded. 63 years ago, a dozen Americans gathered for what was then called the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence. What began as a small group of scientists has now become a worldwide industry, and America has never looked back. Today, we have eight of the top 13 universities for AI and six of the top 10. Just as important as the number of great schools we have is the impact our scholars make in their field. American scholarly publications are cited 83% more than the average of global AI publications. Our innovative industries are also booming. America has roughly 2,000 AI companies, more than double our, global, our closest global competitor. We boast more AI unicorns, those being startups valued over a billion dollars, than any other nation. Of the 32 AI unicorns, the United States has 17. When you look at spending on the AI R&D from some of the world's largest tech companies, American corporations collectively outspend their foreign counterparts by roughly six times this past year alone. In addition, in 2018, America's venture capital funding of AI was roughly double that of our closest competitor. I think everybody in this room knows AI is going to transform American industry. From breakthroughs in medicine to advanced transportation, more personalized education, the promise of AI is boundless. Just yesterday, the White House hosted nearly 200 leaders from government, industry, and academia for the AI in Government Summit, discussing innovative applications to leverage this powerful tool for improving government services. The U.S. has pushed the boundaries of computational power. We have given our innovators the freedom to thrive, and today we can proudly say America continues to be the leader in artificial intelligence. Now, the Trump administration is committed to maintaining and strengthening that leadership, which is why the federal government continues to prioritize AI research and development. I'm pleased to announce that today the administration released a new supplement report to the president's FY 2020 budget identifying nearly $1 billion in non-defense AI R&D. This number is incredibly important in so many ways. This is the first ever reporting of agency-by-agency agency federal investment in non-defense AI R&D. This new supplement report 
demonstrates just how diverse and extensive our efforts are, laying out our spending across the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Energy, and many other agencies. It provides an important mechanism and baseline for tracking U.S. AI R&D spending moving forward. By breaking down exactly how we are spending our non-defense AI R&D dollars, we can better identify opportunities for future investment, conduct long-term strategic planning across the government, and find new opportunities for collaboration between the federal government, industry, and academia. And it demonstrates the increased emphasis on AI R&D under this administration. For perspective, in 2016, the federal government spent a billion dollars on AI R&D total, including defense spending. Today's nearly one billion figure doesn't include defense, so you can truly see how much non-defense R&D has grown in just a short period of time. While the Department of Defense keeps the aggregate level of defense AI investment classified, the DOD is investing in many highly visible and impactful programs, including at DARPA, Project MAVEN, and the Joint AI Center, totaling nearly another billion dollars. So importantly, we also know that so much more AI investment activity is happening across the U.S. innovation ecosystem, thanks to our robust private sector and academic community. I encourage you all to take a look at the document, which was just released this morning on AI.gov. Although America is the leader in AI, China is working to catch up. We see the comparisons and headlines all the time. Too often, the conversation focuses almost exclusively not on where America is dominant, but instead on the alleged disparity in government spending on AI R&D. However, in this metric, there is a tendency to compare apples to oranges. It's absolutely critical to remember that when the United States releases AI R&D spending information, it is annualized and it is directly related to research and development alone. The new budget supplement released today is the perfect example. In American AI R&D budgets, you won't find aspirational expenditures or cryptic funding mechanisms. You also won't find the U.S. government picking and choosing winners in the AI field. What you will find is in America an innovative ecosystem that drives innovation, creativity, and breakthroughs like no country on Earth. Our collective investments from the federal government and the private sector, the success of our scholars and our innovators, and the unsurpassed quality of our business and academic institutions remain unmatched. So today our goal is very clear. The uniquely American ecosystem must do everything in its collective power to keep America's lead in the AI race and build on our successes. And we must continue to do so in a way that embraces American values and spirit of innovation for the benefit of the American people. Our leadership is about more than R&D dollars. Our future rests on getting AI right. AI will support the jobs of the future. It is and will continue to drive economic growth. It is advancing our national security, and it is improving our daily lives. When we lead in AI, it will drive our free and prosperous future. Authoritarian nations look at new technologies as another way to control their people, using AI to surveil their population, limit free speech, and violate fundamental rights. This is not the American way. Our vision for artificial intelligence is rooted in the rule of law, respect for rights, and the spirit of freedom. From the plow to the television, to the radio, to the mobile phone, and to the internet, America's spirit has driven innovation, embraced technology, and in turn, technological breakthroughs have lifted Americans up. As the President said in his executive order launching the American Artificial Intelligence Initiative, continued American leadership in AI is of paramount importance to maintaining the economic and national security of the United States and to shaping the global evolution of AI in a manner consistent with our nation's values, policies, and priorities. With this vision in mind, earlier this year, the Trump administration unveiled the American AI Initiative our strategy to ensure American dominance in artificial intelligence. This is by far the boldest action the federal government has ever taken on artificial intelligence. Ultimately, the American AI Initiative has five main pillars. First, as I've discussed today, the initiative focuses on investments in AI R&D. The President has called for agencies across the government to prioritize AI research and development, as demonstrated by the new AI budget supplement and the recent update to our R&D strategic plan. 
We will continue to leverage America's vibrant R&D ecosystem of industry, academia, and government to advance the most cutting edge ideas and to bring the developments directly to all Americans. Second, we are working to unleash federal AI resources. We want to improve public access to high quality federal data that can drive even more AI research and testing. The third pillar of the initiative is to remove barriers to AI innovation. Our goal is to promote innovation while protecting America's civil liberties and privacy. We're developing official regulatory guidance that will determine how federal agencies should approach the use of AI in the private sector. We're also working to strengthen federal engagement in the creation of the technical standards we need for AI development and deployment. NIST has already made great progress. Just last month, they released a plan for federal engagement in the development of AI standards that will be reliable, robust, and trustworthy. Our fourth pillar focuses on the very root of our nation's strength and success, the American worker. The President has directed federal agencies to prioritize artificial intelligence in their grants and in their fellowships. We're helping the American people gain the AI-relevant skills through apprenticeships, workforce training, STEM education, and learning opportunities. Fifth, we are promoting an international environment supportive of American AI innovation. Recently, the Trump administration made history by joining together with democracies of the world that share our common values when we signed an international consensus document on AI principles at the OECD in Paris. These principles complement our own national strategy, and we look forward to continuing this partnership with our allies. We will continue to develop new technologies in a way that advance innovation, promote public trust, protect civil liberties, and remain consistent with our common principles. Our holistic strategy will improve our development of AI, empower the American people, promote innovative uses of new technology, and stay true to our values. We start from a position of great strength, and we have a plan to keep winning. I am looking forward to working with all of you to retain our American leadership in artificial intelligence. Thank you. Well, thank you again. That was uh, very much appreciated, and I think really sets the stage for the, the conversation that we want to be having, that we're glad is happening in federal agencies, and, and that we want to see continue in the months ahead. Um, what I'd like to do now is introduce um, the great set of panelists we have here to continue with this conversation. To my left is Frank Torres, the Director of Consumer Affairs at Microsoft. Um, continuing down the line is Fiona Alexander, the Distinguished Policy Strategist in Residence in the School of International Service at American University, and also the former Associate Administrator for International Affairs at NTIA. Uh, to her left is Anthony Robbins, the Vice President of North America Public Sector at NVIDIA. Uh, then we have uh, Jackie uh, Medic Mediki, um, <laughs> the Director and Managing Attorney of U.S. AI and Healthcare Policy at Intel, um, and Michael McLaughlin, a research analyst here at the Center for Data Innovation, who is um, the lead author on this report that we recently released, um, ranking the U.S., China, and the EU. So thanks to all of you uh, for being here today and for not having even longer titles, because I don't think I get that all out. Um, so I, I want to start, there, there's three main questions I want us to dig into today. Um, the first one is the, around this theme of, of why does U.S. leadership in AI matter? Um, then I want to talk about how the United States compares to other nations in AI. And then I want to get to this, the, I think, the core question, which is how does the United States wish to be doing to maintain or increase its leadership um, in AI? So let's start with the, the first question, um, which is really the, the fundamental one, which is, you know, should the U.S. government be focusing on this? Is AI leadership something that's important? Um, there's a number of, of people who say AI is just any other technology. Why should we have a national strategy around this? Why should we be committing, you know, a billion dollars in, in R&D and resources? And why should the private sector be so interested in this? Is this just a buzzword? Um, so I want to open that one up to the panel. Um, Frank, maybe I'll start with you because Microsoft – uh, what's always so striking to me about Microsoft is people often don't remember that Microsoft's one of the, the leading computer science research institutes basically in the world, and it has been forever, I mean, you know, since its, its beginning. And so when we talk about AI and its early, early origins, you know, you've had researchers at Microsoft working on these problems since, you know, before they were buzzwords. So I, I'd love to start with your perspective. Right. Well, you, as with a lot of uh, – 
the in industrial um, advances that have been made uh, throughout history, a, a lot of that has happened um, here in the United States. Um, it, it's interesting because with AI, it's it's slightly different in that it's it's more global probably than any other thing that we've experienced and in terms of like an industrial revolution if you make that comparison certainly we're poised um, uh, you know to continue to be a leader simply because we've got that leadership capabilities I mean just given uh, the way say even Microsoft has gone uh, about development of technology since our founding um, and our evolution as a company and our learnings, both from our successes as well as our mistakes. Um, you know, just today, um, uh, our, the president of our company, Brad Smith, and Carol Ann Brown um, published a book, uh, Tools and Weapons, that talks about not just our experience at Microsoft, um, but it gives a, a, a historical perspective as well as um, kind of learnings that we've heard from other other uh, companies and organizations and entities and um, experts and, and people that are grappling with the issues around artificial intelligence. Um, you know, so uh, you know, it, I advise folks to read the book. I went through it last night, um, and uh, very, it covers a lot of ground, but in a really um, understandable and, a, and an approachable way, in a way that just makes almost common sense. Um, and so I, I think to, the roundabout way of, of getting to, to the answer to the question, I think that you know, we're not the only company uh, grappling with uh, some of these issues. Um, we have very thoughtful leadership. Um, uh, we've worked um, with uh, uh, various folks in the government as they advance their policies as well. Um, you know, we, we've got a, a, a stake in this as Microsoft, but we also have a stake in this as, as the United States. Um, at the same time, and I appreciated uh, uh, Michael Kratzios's comments and recognition in the executive order that this is a global thing. So we also have to take that into account, that our success here, you know, it, success for a U.S. company or the U.S. here means that we have to be successful globally. Um, if you look at the, you know, if you're a consumer company, um, the majority of uh, the world's consumers are actually sit outside the United States. They sit outside of, of, uh, of other big countries. And so um, we've got to take that into account too. And, and I think just given the country's history, given the uh, great technological leadership that we have here, um, we can continue to lead, keeping in mind the international and global aspects and, and, and the promises of innovation that it can bring, not just here, but around the world as well. Yeah. And I, I forgot to add, just sorry, I, I don't mean to take up a lot of time, but just the, the, to talk about the promise of AI. Um, when you think about um, what benefit it can bring to citizens both here and abroad, we need to take a, a advantage of that and grow that um, uh, opportunity. And Jackie, I, I suspect there's a similar kind of perspective in terms of thinking about the global stage. I mean, Intel, NVIDIA, you're, you're both global companies and you're thinking about this problem in a global sense. How do, you, how do you reconcile that vision as a company with also this need for U.S. leadership? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So as my colleague mentioned, you know, you have to look at this globally. Um, AI is, is really, as my, as my colleague very astutely pointed out, you know, there is – AI is very different than other technologies we've seen in the past where there is a global interest, there is a global involvement. Um, and it's also a technology that goes across all sectors. Um, and that's something that's very unique and very uh, different. Um, but on the flip side, you know, we are an American company. We, um, we manufacture here. We also manufacture abroad. But uh, most of our um, consumer base is, is abroad. Um, and so we can't really look at it as a zero-sum game. I think the U.S. does need to continue to, to lead and, and um, have the resources to manage the technology and manage the technology leadership. But we really do need to think about how are we working with other countries? How are we making sure that we have access to those markets? How are we making sure we're protecting our IP? Um, that it's so critical for us to be able to um, continue to lead. Um, and all of those things, we need we need to look at it, but we also need to really keep in mind the global nature of it and the, the need to actually access those markets and work with those the other countries and, and work with other markets. Thanks. Um, and Anthony, I mean, I know NVIDIA has spoken a lot 
about you know how AI is something different than just some of these other um, technology changes we see in the market. How are you communicating about that? Well, I think our view is, is the mic close enough to me? So I think our view is that AI is going to affect every person in every country and every company around the world. And so with, with that in mind, of course the, the U.S. would care about having a, a material position. I think we, I think the U.S. federal government invests $150 billion a year um, from a research and development standpoint. So I, I think the, the money that we spend is more than adequate. Um, I think we can improve our focus and, and get aligned to how AI can make this world a, a, a better world, a safer world, uh, and the like. And there's a, an amazing amount of things that are actually occurring right now, and I think we'll, this panel will probably talk about it. But the U.S. should care about what's happening on the global stage because of the fact that it's going to affect so many people, so many companies, and so many countries. Already today, I think there's more than 40, more than 40 nations that have AI national strategies for their nations, right? So it's, so it's, it's a big deal. It's the most transformative technology in the history of planet Earth. And that's why the U.S. should care a lot. <laughs> that's the selling point. Um, Fiona, I, I want to um, – one of the reasons I, I really wanted you to join this panel is because, um, I mean, you've always been very thoughtful about U.S. technology policy leadership. And at NTIA, you really saw the, the way the U.S. led in the Internet governance uh, area. I suspect there's a lot of lessons to be learned there in terms of as we're thinking about this new wave of innovation around AI, you know, what it took to be successful in having U.S. leadership in the Internet era, in the Internet governance space, and what that means in the AI space. Uh, so I'd love your reflections on that. Sure. It's been really – thank you for the invitation. It's been really interesting to listen to <clears throat> the comments of the other panelists so far. And I would say that uh, I'm not sure AI is the first time the rest of the world has been involved in the development of the technology. <clears throat> Definitely was something we dealt with in the domain name space in that um, era. The, the one and over the you know the 20 years I was at NTA it was always what's the next topic what's the next plan is the US government going to do a strategic plan other countries are doing strategic plans and the US government tends not to do those um, instead relying on underlying basic principles that we thought and think um, I have to stop speaking for the US government it's only been a few months since I left um, but the government thought um, uh, for would guide us through I think the one thing that makes AI different and and this is I think it's been touched on briefly here is the cross-sectoral nature of it. So, um, you know, in, pr in previous technology revolutions or environments as things were developing, you still had very siloed industries. You still had transportation. You still had aviation. You still had, you know, whatever the topics were, and people would go along in their merry way, as reflected in our internal U.S. government processes, working on their different issues, and the two didn't intersect in a meaningful way. And what you see with AI, and I think the Internet sort of started that. You started seeing more and more parts of the U.S. government involved in different aspects of Internet policy or if you were on the defense side, cyber, because economic people call it Internet and defense people call it cyber, but it basically is the same thing still. And what AI is proving is that it's now everywhere and um, in, in the sense that it's not just one particular technology and you can't have a siloed policy approach anymore. You have to look across sectors and you have to say, how am I going to make the best of this environment so that the United States can benefit? And that's not just the government and government research, but, you know, U.S. economic growth and individual citizens and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And um, Michael, one of the things that this was already touched on a little bit, but I'd like you to expand on. Um, there's this question about, you know, is this a zero-sum game? Um, I think we see some areas where it is and, and some areas where it isn't. Um, can you talk about, you know, what areas you think the U.S. should be um, collaborating on with other countries? So, can everyone hear me? I think there's several areas, certainly from a, um, in medicine and education. I think these are, multi these are already areas we already are seeing collaboration, even between the United States and China. Um, just a couple of months ago, a report came out that U.S. and Chinese researchers had collaborated on creating an AI system that could diagnose childhood diseases with roughly 90 percent or more accuracy. And they used the electronic health records of uh, hundreds of thousands of Chinese individuals to do that. So certainly um, in areas like health, I think that's not a zero-sum game. That's an area where we can help the entire planet. I think that's a similar type of engagement can happen in areas such as education as well. Um, then from 
a economic standpoint, I do want to say there is somewhat of a zero-sum game there in some instances if you look at firms trying to obtain global market share and what that can mean for those firms. So if U.S. firms are increasing their global market share and they're increasing their revenues, ultimately they can reinvest that revenue back in to their R&D to create more innovative products and services. They can invest that money back into their own employees to pay them higher to hire more employees. And on the flip side, if U.S. firms are not competitive globally, ultimately we could see a situation where they start to contract and obviously that's not what we want. Thanks. I, I want to open that up to the rest of the panel as well. If there's, if there's any areas where you think we should be focusing on maybe the zero-sum aspect of it, for example, one area that we looked at in our report was around um, you know, uh, talent flow and just that although long-term we want to increase that number, short-term there is a limit to where the top talent can go. And you know there are going to be kind of winners and losers in that area, um, but also to the question of collaboration, where you think there's opportunities to collaborate. On the collaboration st standpoint, I think it'd be interesting if you follow what the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center is doing around humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. In the U.S., I think in the reported year of 2017, I think we spent 306 billion dollars in response to natural disasters. And I think that reporting year was mostly around hurricanes and, of course, wildfires you know, and tsunamis are also big deals. And so the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center under um, General Shanahan's leadership is collaborating with Singapore, who has a wonderful reputation for doing uh, smart city and interesting technologies. Um, and so if you think about how the world responds to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, um, I think there's a really a, a great opportunity, like healthcare, for the world to collaborate in that in that space or use case, if you will. Any other thoughts? Sure. I, I, just two, two two thoughts. Well, one on each of those topics that you raised. Uh, the first is on collaboration. The, the other, uh, and the humanitarian example is perhaps a good one, but also um, you know, collaboration amongst. Um, at least the technology companies and, and governments even to address some of the challenges that we face, say around cybersecurity, and I'm sure there, there are other issues like that as well, um, where it really uh, takes a village, so to speak, um, to, to perhaps address some of those uh, uh, issues in, in an appropriate and, and good way. Um, uh, just you, we talk about you also mentioned talent. Um, just two aspects of that. I, I don't want to make sure don't, don't get left out. One is, you know, there's certainly talent at the university sort of level and the grad level and the researcher level, um, and those people tend to be brilliant. I've had an opportunity to spend an awful lot of time with some of our researchers, and you always learn something new or look at things a different way um, in, in how they go about solving problems that have lots of lessons. I think for for governments and, and, and everyone else and to help how to solve real world problems using this technology. But you've got to start somewhere. And I forget, I heard a number yesterday about the number of computer science teachers that we graduated in the country last year. If I remember the number correctly, it was rather low. If you think about kind of what it takes to reach that level, we need to start educating our children earlier in the process. We need to provide them with opportunities across the country um, to provide that sort of um, uh, uh, knowledge base. Um, you know, and I'm talking about we, we've got a program uh, that we're working on with others to to draw to try to provide to make sure the resources for computer science education in the school. So when you talk about talent, there's that. There's also um, and, and you may be getting to this uh, later, but how, how do we address uh, issues uh, uh, surrounding making sure that the current workforce um, has the opportunity to get skills um, or retraining if, if that's needed as well? And so there's a, a lot of different aspects of this, but if we want to be successful and want to be a leader, we've got to look at the uh, whole picture. Another area where it's important for the U.S. to be collaborating with others is making sure that you're setting the right policy environment. And this is particularly important because AI is, is based on data, and these data sets are global, and you want to make sure you have great free-flowing data and free-flowing global data sets. So uh, Michael had mentioned the exercise of the OECD, um, which culminated in a recommendation, and then the G20 adopting these principles. But you have to do more than just develop and principles. You actually have to implement them. And so the OECD is going to be going forward, I think, in, in starting the 
this fall and developing some practical steps to help countries figure out how to implement these principles. Um, and there's a policy observatory. But at the same time, there's still a thread and a, a big push in Europe to look at more, I would say, maybe GDPR-like approach to AI, which is not necessarily going to be great, I think, for what people here want to do. So that's going to be a challenge. How do you engage in a collaborative way and focus people into the OECD, but still recognize even some of your closest allies have a very different approach? And I, th I believe that um, you know France and Canada and others are still continuing on a global panel on artificial intelligence, and I don't think the U.S. is a part of that exercise, instead focusing on OECD. So that's going to be an important place to navigate and figure out what to do. Yeah. Can I say with you on, on that point about how other countries have different perspectives on this? Because that was also true in, in the Internet era. And I think one thing that helped the U.S. Um, influence globally what other countries decided to do around <laughs> Internet policy was the fact that we were home to some of the top Internet companies. Can you talk about kind of your experience in, in terms of interacting with other countries? Because there were so many debates about you know, issues like content, uh, free speech, you know, what type of things should be, uh, you know, copyright issues that consistently came up where the U.S.'s interests and perspectives were very different than many other countries and how you'd kind of navigate that and how that might play out in this. So I think it's important you can't engage enough with people if they have different perspectives from you, right? It, it may sound a little bit challenging and the conversations can be hard, but until you sit down and across the table from someone and talk to them, you don't understand what they're actually trying to get at. And by doing that, maybe you can help shape their position so you're not so quite a, a far apart. I think for, for any administration, um, I think you have to have a clear set of principled objectives and you have to be clear what is it you're trying to achieve and why. Yes, you want to do something that benefits the American economy and American companies, but you have, a princi you have principles behind what you're doing, and that helps you very much when you're explaining to people if you're, if you're any country or advocating for anything what you're doing. So I think that's important to do in this space. Jackie, I know you had some thoughts. Yeah, um, uh, just going a little bit back to, to your, your previous question um, with regards to where's, where there's room for collaboration. Climate change is another one, which is a, a little bit related to your disaster relief. Um, and, and, but at some place that I think, and, and actually my colleagues sort of beat me to the punch a little bit on this, but some place where I think there is a zero-sum game is, is when we look at education, particularly particularly in the lower grades. Um, I was very heartened yesterday during the White House summit. There was a lot of talk about programs and, and thoughts about reskilling um, and, and training of um, you know mid to, to, to late um, career workers but what I didn't hear any talk about was can we bring some of this this into the into grade schools and what should we be doing with the lower grades um, I had the opportunity and I know the second time you've heard this story but I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in Estonia which is very is known and is one of the most advanced countries uh, technology wise in the in the EU and they're at seven years old they have a curriculum where they they start teaching computer and um, uh, uh, coding and I was actually there on a program to teach coding and and AI to uh, to girls um, in in underprivileged school areas, and what we found is that 80% of the girls coded, and 30% of the girls were advanced coders, and to the point where we had to run back and revamp our curriculum to, to make it challenging for them. But when I see that, and I, you know, I have children at home, and I see what they can do, um, I am a little bit concerned that, that we're not talking more about starting younger, because these kids, when they come into the workforce, are going to be the ones that are going to really drive this innovation even further um, and, and add a whole lot of value. And I can't let, let go without sort of jumping on your point a little bit, which is I think another big miss for, for the U.S. Is our, is our failure to have a robust national privacy legislation that, that um, really sets the bar right now. We have all, all these states, I think there's, gosh, a ton of them now that, that have legislation either in process or enacted that is creating this patchwork of regulations that, that just makes it more difficult. Um, and we need to have regulation that that's really thinking about making data available. So how do you also, not only do you protect it and do you want to um, have all of the right protections around the use of the data, but you also want to have data that you can use for, for these technologies. And I think that's a really big miss on our part, on the U.S.'s part. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I think that's a great segue to um, the next question I had, which is, you know, really about how the United States compares to other nations. Um, I was really struck by, you know, Michael, I thought made a great point earlier about, you know, we want to make sure we're not comparing apples and oranges. Um, uh, Michael McLaughlin here, um, when he was working on this report, I think did a lot of work to make sure that while we had data on apples and oranges, we tried to 
harmonize the data so that it was comparable. Um, Michael, I just want to ask you to talk a little bit about, you know, w what you see in kind of the key points in terms of what the data shows about how the U.S. stands. So I think Michael Kratzios did a pretty good job of laying out why the United States leads, and he's certainly uh, correct in that, and that's what the data shows. There is a, a but attached to that, and that's China and the threat of China. So if you look at the AI race from, or break it down into six different categories, from a research standpoint, a talent standpoint, the ability to develop firms, the hardware that's powering AI systems, and then as adoption and data, you'll see that the United States leads those first four areas, and that China is actually leading in adoption and data. So in research, the United States leads because, as Michael said, we simply have the highest research quality by far of any major nation really outside of uh, the UK as well. Um, from a talent standpoint, we also lead from there because we have, um, quite frankly, the best researchers in the world. Um, but in both those areas, if you look at research, um, China's research quality has improved vastly over the past five years. Um, they also publish more AI papers than us every year. So. They may never reach our research quality, but if you look at, say, um, the Inst Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence came out with a report this past year that showed that there's a real threat in the next five or so years that China surpasses the U.S. in terms of the top 10 percent, 5 percent, 1 percent of most cited AI papers. Then if you look at it from a talent standpoint, um, there is a, a fairly large talent gap right now between China and the United States. However, this is an area where, you know, the Chinese government has put in a plan to um, train 5,000 students over the next five years in artificial intelligence to minimize that gap. Um, as far as the ability to develop firms, fortunately we, we do have the most startups in the world. We have the most startups that have received more than a million dollars of funding. Um, we have our firms acquire more startups than any other um, country in the world. Um, there too though, over the past two years, while the U.S. leads say in venture capital and private equity funding, um, China has received about 80 percent of the level of the United States. That may sound like there's a decent gap there, but if you compare that to the European Union, which is about you know, one-fifth of the level of the United States or lower, you see that China is really actually competing with us there. And then lastly, in hardware, thanks to firms such as Intel and NVIDIA, you know, we do have a great lead there. Um, some experts have said that you know, China might have a better opportunity to compete in creating semiconductors specifically for AI purposes than the traditional semiconductor market overall. And then in the last two areas, which is in data and adoption, I'm sure most people here are probably not that surprised to find out that China's leading in data due to its large size. But um, in adoption, that's actually one of the surprising areas we found, where is that Chinese firms are actually adopting and piloting AI at higher rates than both U.S. and Western firms. And I think the concerning thing about that is, you know, we want our firms to use um, AI to become more productive so they can compete on a global scale. So it is somewhat concerning to see that the rate of adoption is just not as high in the U.S. right now. Thanks. I want to open this up to the panel, too, just in terms of um, what you're seeing in the marketplace right now, um, in terms of what the U.S. strengths are and what the U.S. weaknesses are um, compared to other, other markets. Yeah, I would, a couple of things. I, I mentioned earlier that I think our, one of our strengths is the enormity of our, our total R&D spending. I think it's, it's, it's enormous. Um, even if you look at the IT spend in the federal government alone, it's like $90 billion. If you exclude the embedded technology that's a part of like large scale government programs so it's it's even more than that so i think we, we i think we have a lot of money and i think we spend a lot of money um i don't i don't think the money is prioritized on the ai opportunity the way that it could be um in the other area in the other area of data uh, you know, while we don't know exactly how much data the federal government has, we, we generally say that the federal government is largely the, probably the largest producer and consumer of data outside of the cloud service providers. So, and, and that is the oil that makes this uh, artificial intelligence thing go. And so there's a lot of work that's going on relative to the federal data strategy. And I think the, the U.S.'s ability to open up that data to commercial companies, innovators, and classic defense industrial base alone, um, or, or together, gives us an enormity opportunity. So I think we spend enough, I think we have enough money there, needs to be appro more appropriately focused. I think we have a ton of data that we need to make av more broadly available. And, if we, and when we can't make it available, we need to do a better job of, of, of getting access to it inside the federal government and labeling it so that, that the government and, and contractors can work on, on that. And then- Can I just ask you, before you move on, yeah. um, on the, the R&D funding part, when you say it's not prioritized 
correctly. Uh, what would you change about that? Give you a little I would specific. Put a lot more money on the AI thing. So, so you know, Michael Kratzios today said, you know, reference putting a billion dollars mm -hmm. on that, and that's interesting, you know. But it's, you know, but the, you know, we'll spend billions of dollars trying to build the fastest supercomputer in the world, which is down at Oak Ridge, mm -hmm. you know. And and so the the number is interesting, right? It's it's certainly more interesting than at the time that the executive order on artificial intelligence was signed in February, there's no really, there's no funding that was kind of applied to it. And that was a big question that, that, um, that the industry had, okay, where was the funding? So a billion is certainly a great thing and it's certainly very interesting, but it's not nearly enough. If you think about the transformative power of artificial intelligence against the use cases, look, in, in the case of waste, fraud and abuse, the U.S. spent $147 billion you know, last year, and $147 billion of taxpayer dollars in the area of waste, fraud, and abuse. And that area can be tackled by the use of data analytics, data science, and artificial intelligence. You know, and the same with healthcare and cybersecurity and humanitarian and, and assistance and disaster relief. And, and I'll just take one other example. Um, so the, the number one financial challenge in the Department of Defense is platform sustainment. It's not, it's not like that interesting, you know, but that's the number one financial challenge across of the Department of Defense. So if you take like the Joint Strike Fighter, it's going to cost a trillion dollars once fully fielded in 2035. Seven hundred billion dollars of that cost is going to be in sustaining the platform. After the amazing engineering that takes place to, to build it, conceive it, and field it, 700 billions can be spent to to maintain it in the field. And that's just the Joint Strike Fighter, and there's platforms across the entire Department of Defense. And so Ellen Lord and, and Mr. Roper and all have said that platform sustainment is a priority and it's a challenge for uh, AI and data science. Yet, if you look at the <coughs> funding that's occurring there, Right, you know, we we're doing million dollar awards to startup companies, mm -hmm. but the reality is, you don't get AI into operations in areas like platform sustainment unless you come into the defense industrial base. So I think so. Why we have this infatuation with Boston, Austin, Silicon Valley, and the like? I think we should, and we should be excited about the startups and the innovation that occurs. We should not miss the fact that the defense industrial base is actually what's going to get us into operations. And so I think we have to inspire the adoption of artificial intelligence against key use cases and inside of the big companies in the U.S. Mm -hmm. to go at speed and scale. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to say, I read your report and I actually really loved the idea of sort of looking at AI from the point of view of development versus adoption. Um, and I do think that adoption and, and building trust in the U.S. with the use of AI is, is really something that, that's lacking and something that there needs to be a lot of focus on. Um, certainly in, in China, the, the trust is absolutely there way more than it is. I'm actually still amazed when I go up to the hill and I'm talking to, to, to people who are making policy, still getting the you know they're, they're coming to get us they're coming to kill us right and and you know, i'm still having these conversations so so much of it is about the education but also the government has think really has a role where these countries that i've seen at least my my personal perspective where i've seen that ai has really been embraced and is trusted are company are countries where um, the government has r put out ai tools that have made the the citizenries life and experience better and and I hate to harp on it, Estonia but it you know it's a great example in Estonia if you um, you know if a child is born they go into a registry and when that child is ready five years later when that child is it's time for that child to go to school they automatically get enrolled and they automatically get a notice um, they also have this this um, policy where you enter things once so if you enter your address in a government registry you would never have to enter your address again i mean even stuff like that you're like oh thank god <laughs> right for all of us who've gone to every single agency and pulled it put in our address so i think there is a real government role and there is actually frankly i think a little bit of failure here um to not create that trust and not show you know examples of ai um, and how ai can help us and how it's more in in assisted with humans rather than overtaking the human. Yeah. And Fiona, um, so one of the questions I had for you was just, you know, is is there something, um, you had mentioned the fact that, you know, other countries always like national strategies in the past. Is there something different with AI? Because when I was thinking about that same question earlier, um, with broadband, which was the focus of a lot of the national strategies, it seemed like it was something 
slightly different. Obviously, a lot of countries were trying to kind of move into this internet era and they wanted to innovate in that space, but a lot of their strategies were really focused on connectivity to the home or connectivity to businesses, and they weren't really trying to do connectivity different than anywhere else. They just wanted to have 100% connectivity. So with AI, though, it seems like there's more of a not just can we have 100% AI or whatever the equivalent would be, but really can we be a leader in a fundamentally different way? Do we have unique access to AI talent, research, capabilities that other countries don't have? Do you think that creates a, a different type of dynamic there? I, I do, and I think that, um, as I said earlier, I think AI is actually different than others' uh, issues in the past because it's so cross-sectoral in a way that we haven't seen. And I do think broadband development or deployment may have been the test case for that. And you could argue whether the different strategies were successful or not. But in the same way that broadband national strategies and even the stuff adopted in the US had to deal with both development of networks and adoption, I think AI has to do the same. And I, it was interesting to me as I read the report that the US is scoring low on adoption and, and data, I think, yes. we or two. And so adoption is similar to we still have low broadband adoption. We might have great deployment. People aren't using it, so why aren't aren't people using it. So this is definitely a question that needs to be addressed. And then the reason you're probably scoring low on data is this lack of a clarity on what our privacy regime is. Um, and again, I think, you know, um, the benefit of, of working across four administrations is I can talk about what I did in all of the different ones. Um, and in the Obama administration, there was a push to do sort of a comprehensive approach to, to data privacy and the proposal for a privacy uh, blueprint or a consumer bill of rights that didn't go anywhere and didn't get traction or support from the companies. And the result was that privacy playing field got taken over by Europe. And GDPR is now setting the standards, whether you like it or not. And the question is, how do you deal with that? So if you don't step in in this next set of issues, you're going to have the same problem in, as, as a US in terms of leading and impacting it. So there's got to be a way to deal with what is our what is going to be our, regardless of where you sit on this fence, what is the US approach going to be to privacy? There needs to be some clarity, both from the administration and from Congress, as to what it is we're doing and how are you going to interact with other countries in that space. And I would say adoption is the same. And in this case, I would say broadband adoption. And when I look and I, at, the, at the White House's efforts on AI, and as Michael was talking about, and what collectively is there, big push on R&D. I mean, the things that the US government always does, where, where we procure, we impact policy. And where we spend dollars for research, we impact policy. So that's happening and that's going along. You know, you could argue it's not the most effective, I think, as you've described, or maybe it needs to be more targeted, and then US data sets. But what's lacking really is this clarity on policy. And there's, you know, privacy is not part of this AI strategy. Broadband is not part of this AI strategy. Maybe someone needs to take a look at that if you're looking at American leadership going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that, that there's been a, a lot of good issues uh, raised here on completely agree on, on broadband band adoption. Um, you know, AI adoption is certainly important, but there's certainly still parts of the country that aren't connected yet, um, and, and we need to solve that. And uh, we've got a, an initiative called the Airband Initiative uh, that, that's, um, you know, really making great strides in, in, in trying to, uh, in a typical Microsoft fashion, um, my, my, one of my colleagues, Paul Garnett, has very strong metrics that he has to meet, and how, how many people are we connecting um, or helping to connect, working with, with local partners? Um, and, and so that's going to be uh, 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 critically important if, if we want adoption. Um, uh, on, on data, certainly a, a great points that, that have been raised here and, and you know, in, in, in Brad's book, um, he talks about, he calls it kind of the open data revolution. How, how do we open up data sets, not just that the government has, but that other people may have? Uh, Daniel, as you know, um, we recently put out some model uh, data uh, sharing agreements um, because it does get a little bit complicated. You know, it's one thing if you own the data and the data is yours and you want to share it. Uh, it's another, but still retain some ownership of it. It's another thing if it's pulled down from public database or if it's proprietary. Um, you know, certainly, um, you know, before you share it, that there you, you probably want to put some things in place. And so, you know, we've got to work through some of these issues. I mean, with the government setting, I think some of the issues there is simply the data is siloed. I mean, I think that happens, uh, you know, perhaps even a, across companies. It's not machine readable. It's in different formats. You hear all these sorts sorts of things. How do we solve that problem to allow for access to, to the data? And then there's, you know, there's the, the privacy certainly aspects of the issue. And I think. Uh, th that is going to um, be one that we're just going to have to resolve. You know, strong interest in protecting users' privacy, yet in order to drive AI innovation, you need 
access to data. You know, say in the healthcare setting, it can do all sorts of wonderful things. At the same time, highly sensitive. The potential for harm if it's abused, misused, leaked out um, is great. So how do you kind of resolve that? That's going to be, I, I think, a critical question that we have to answer. But even going beyond that, there's the whole panoply of uh, and very important uh, issues around uh, data ethics, and, and um, I, I know that, that Michael Crutchio has, uh, has spoke about kind of the civil rights components. I, I think it is getting at kind of the, the fairness and bias issues. How do we kind of be thoughtful about that and really look at the implications? Um, I've learned that as much as time as I've spent on privacy and looking at some of these issues, when I talk to some of our researchers, some of this stuff gets really nuanced, but it's important to try to figure out what the implications are to make sure that, that the data is being used in the right way that really helps um, you know, everyone uh, 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 across the, 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 the country. Um, Thanks. Um, I, I think it's really interesting that you mentioned um, data and, and obviously um, uh, Fiona had just mentioned the, the privacy aspect uh, in one of the Euro Com European Commission uh, divisions just put out a paper about the impact of GDPR on scientific research and you know the, the unintended consequences basically that they were seeing and how you know that's one of the problems with some of these regulations is they don't kind of see how it ended up locking up some scientific data um, because of concerns about how it could be shared and I think that's a, an important question that we have as we're thinking about data, as you said, Frank, I mean, in so many different domains that we're going to have to make accessible. And, and just one other point, as we move towards 5G, mm -hmm. right, the, the issue is more profound, right, because we're going to go from hundreds of millions to billions and trillions of devices on networks creating this enormity of data that's beyond, I think, what most people are actually forecasting. So this data challenge gets bigger, you know, quickly here. Right, absolutely. Um, Jackie, I wanted to turn back to you because Intel put out a, um, a great policy um, briefing outlining its vision for what uh, U.S. policy around AI or whether what U.S. AI strategy could be. I wanted to ask, I know you've talked about a few of these already, but um, what are some of the other ideas you have in that document? Um, yeah, actually, so uh, one of the ones is that the um, removing removing barriers to to the um, to development and adoption of AI, and so a lot of that was looking at um, various legislation. So on a healthcare side, HIPAA HIPAA is way out of date. Um, so that gets back to the use of data and, and how data can be used. Um, you know, if you start looking down the sectors and all of these highly regulated re regulated sectors, you'll see that you know some of the uh, barriers to adoption are, are very much within the regulations. You know, particularly in the financial sector. If you think of what China is doing in terms of their banking and, and being able to integrate all of their banking, that's something that would be very difficult for us. Um, the other two, it's interesting, we had pillars also. Um, we looked at liberating data. We thought that was key, and so we've, all, we, we've touched on that. Uh, workforce issues, and that's from, from cradle to grave, again, talking about you know, grade schools and reskilling. Um, and, um, and then research and development. We, I agree with my colleague here that the, the, this, well, it's wonderful to hear about this additional um, funding being allocated. Um, and that that you know it's absolutely needed. But if you look at the the uh, the investment that we've had, um, you know, and taking account for inflation, it's very stagnant. We're nowhere near what we should be if we had continued to invest in the way we had invested. You know, when we started really thinking about doing some of the you know getting our technology industry really ramped up. Um, I really do think that there is need, the need for a, sort of a moonshot where we're really looking at all of these issues and, and creating like major funding for a lot of the different um, research that needs to be done. Um, in academia, there needs to be more research uh, funding provided. They, they are struggling with getting, you know, I think my, my colleague mentioned about the, the, the amount of people graduating with um, computer science degrees. But we're also seeing that they're having a hard time keeping that talent. Um, you know, honestly, the private sector is very alluring um, because there, there's just more money there. But there are folks who want to do funding and want to be in academia. So if we had more funding and more grants and more research money there, there would be more more yeah. happening there too. So um, those are all the things that, that that we included in our recommendations for the national strategy. We do feel like there should be a national strategy, if nothing else, to be more um, focused and targeted in in our approach to to AI. Right. Um, and Frank, I want to come back to you because one of the issues about um, talent that we haven't touched on too much yet is around diversity. 
and that's obviously been a, a theme of, I know, some of Microsoft policy work as well. Can you talk about what you're doing in that space as it relates to AI? Yeah, so um, I, I can't even be, begin to stress um, the importance of diversity um, in the development of this new and emerging uh, technology. Um, uh, is is the technology is coded um, and the training data goes in to train the algorithm. Um, you know, we've learned, uh, uh, I guess one would say the, the hard way, that, you know, it's important to consider how all that is done. And the more diversity we found of people sitting around the table looking at kind of how the technology is being developed, just the better it is. Um, and so it's it's profoundly important to us. It's a big initiative at Microsoft. We constantly uh, challenge ourselves to do a better job about making sure we have uh, diversity in the workforce. Um, it just results in a, in a better product um, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and so, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, it's just uh, a, a very important uh, issue for us. And so I know uh, not just us, but uh, other companies um, uh, in the tech sector and elsewhere, I think, ha have recognized this too. Um, certainly there's lots of organizations um, that, that call uh, the industry to task. Um, and uh, we we've, uh, are, are certainly responding and, and making strides and constantly uh, improving in that area. It's just so important. Okay. Any other comments on that issue specifically? Um, the topic of training, yes. in general, or or training or training in diversity, either one. Yeah. So, in the, excuse me, in the, in the in the area of training, um, you know, I, I can't say this is this this development of artificial intelligence and then the deployment into operations might be the greatest team sport that the federal government has ever needed to play, because they they actually the federal government materially lacks the data science and AI experts that's needed to the size of the problem or opportunity. Um, there's wonderfully talented people in the federal government. I mean, like, if you if you look at the, the technical and scientific achievement that's happened in the U.S. At, at, at the inspiration of the federal government, it's amazing. But we're new and we're early in the case of artificial intelligence. And so so I, I think the, the, the government's got to figure out how they go out to, to startups like they got to figure out how to, and they've got to figure out how they get inspiration from like the defense industrial base um, to to bring those folks on the team in addition to the university work like I think the work that the Air Force is doing with MIT and the Army's doing with Carnegie Mellon and there's many others um, I think there's there's good work so this collaboration between universities startups and and industry partners is is really important then, then inside of the government, I think they've got to figure out how to how to generally train, and, and the worry the worry I would have is 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 they if they just think about how to train the the people, I think they got to train against a focused plan like if waste fraud and abuse or cybersecurity or predictive and preventative maintenance are important, they should train to align to use cases that matter to mission outcomes versus just kind of take on a training program, and then I do think they have to figure out. Like if you look at what if you look at the, what the federal government did in cybersecurity, I would estimate that it's off by a factor of ten with respect to what should be done for artificial intelligence, right? So if you think about you know I don't know how many jobs cyber jobs are open today in the five thousand, yeah, you know, or how many when Tony Scott the, did a cyber sprint, mm -hmm. right? So so I think we have to reimagine the work that we've done to train inside the federal government to align to, to this trend, but we have to we have to think about it in far bigger, greater context. One of the things that was striking to me, I, I looked yesterday on usajobs.gov um, for the number of jobs that had either AI or machine learning, or artificial intelligence or machine learning in there. Um, I found 12 jobs uh, for AI and about the same number, maybe it was 14 for machine learning, and about half of those um, were geospatial that didn't actually have anything to do really with machine learning. Um, they were jobs that paid around forty thousand dollars, which you're yeah. not going to get a yeah. specialist yeah. in. Right. Um, so I, I, my question is kind of is, 
you know, one, where are the jobs? Well, you know, shouldn't the government be hiring more people? But also more broadly, um, you know, it's just staying on this theme of you, you were talking about talent, but that's really, you know, t as you said, talent to get the government to do more. How do we get the government to be doing more in AI, which was the theme of yesterday's conference? You know, I think they're, they're trying to figure out what all they can do. What are, what are some of the ideas on this panel? I have a comment to the like. So I think Project Maven is is an extraordinary example of change leadership, because I I think this 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 AI thing, if you will. And, and for those that aren't familiar with Project Maven, would you? Speak yeah. To so to so under the Department of Defense, what they, they they created what they call the Strategic Capabilities Office, and then under the Strategic Capabilities Office, they stood up a program called Project Maven, which was. You know, to bring, to, you know, to help inspire the development of artificial intelligence to, you know, the drone business, if you will. Um, and so, independent of what that program does, it was an extraordinary example of change leadership in the Department of Defense. And and you kind of say, well, okay, if the Department of Defense can lead at scale, then the federal government should be able to lead at scale. And because you know, they took the the then it was the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, Bob Work, Robert Work, said this is a priority. You know, he put a three star in charge. He funded it, and you know, and they communicated externally to the community, and 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 so they. I just thought it was like this kind of pathfinder of change. I I, I think if they could replicate what they did on Project Maven for waste, fraud, and abuse, predictive and preventative maintenance, and and it, there's a part of that that they're trying to do along these NMIs, <clears throat> excuse me, national mission initiatives mm -hmm. and component mission initiatives in the Department of Defense where they're trying to take health, command and control, cybersecurity, uh, pre predictive and preventative maintenance like these use cases. So they're they're trying to they're trying to get this use case alignment, but that's on the DOD side. And I think on the civilian agency side, I think there's a chance to to replicate kind of this focus. And to me, it seems like it's all about the use case, the talent associated to the use case. You either recruit it or you train it or deploy it. There's the infrastructure that you give them to do the work, and there's the data that they have, right? So those are kind of like the components, many of which are addressed in the executive order. But I think if they fund, if they fund the big use cases that make a difference to this country, you know, I think we can go faster. And, it, and I will just kind of share that, that there was a, a former political appointee who re resigned recently. She, she said to me that, you know, she wasn't worried about any country. She was worried about the Americans. Right? So, so if, if, we, if we come to the table with all the resources that we have, we will be just fine. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to more aggressively apply the resources that we have in an intended direction to get an outcome that we desire. Yeah. Um, there's a lot the U.S. government should be doing. Um, it, to, what I was surprised about yesterday is, as I was listening to some of the examples of different um, ways that they've been using a AI within different agencies, was just how basic the AI that they were implementing really was. Like, you know, in terms of the, if you listen to that and you're like, yeah, the machines aren't coming to get us anytime soon. Like at this point, we're just, we're just analyzing data, right? Um, and there seems to be really a lot of low hanging fruit. So for example, one of the things that was interesting to me was, you know, this NA, uh, NHS, no, what was it, the NHS? Anyway, the agency that, that was uh, reviewing their, their, their regulations for outdated um, and overburdened, what, what it was? It was HHS. HHS. Yeah. Uh, they, one of the things that, that I kept thinking that I kept thinking is why aren't all agencies doing this? Yeah. You know, they refer to it as a pilot. Um, it, you know, it seemed rather preliminary, but I was like, this is just basic stuff. Um, and one of the things that, that really highlights is again, there's really some low hanging fruit and some baseline. Um, you know, the, the executive order was just like the bare minimum to move AI forward. There's some really baseline things that need to be d be done, including, you know, the, the siloing of the agencies is a problem, like that they can't use each other's resources, the, the, the fact that they're not talking to each other, the fact that their systems aren't interoperable. These are all things that need to be fixed if, if we really want AI to be adopted in the government in, in a meaningful way and in a, the, the most successful way, I, I think. So I think there's, there's a ton of really basic work that needs to be done to, to, set, to set the stage for, for successful use of AI within the government. 
And just staying on that, I, one of the themes that I thought came out of the conference yesterday was um, a tension between pursuing lofty grand goals of let's have transformational change in government through AI versus there's all this low-hanging fruit, should we just try and do that first? Um, I'd love to get some perspectives on, on what you think the government should be doing in that regard. It's a, it's a classic challenge. It's a classic challenge in the leadership equation of, of driving change and transformation. You want to look for uh, small opportunities to be successful as quickly as you can, right? So, so taking smaller bites of the apple is a really good thing, right? Um, yet, yet at the same time, we've got to aspire. To kind of, you know, you mentioned mooch. We've got to aspire to some some bigger things because the the. The amount of people that we have and the, the amount of funding that we have and the size of the problem that we have does suggest that we have to go take on some bigger challenges as well. I think we have to do both. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would agree with that, but I, I would say the low-hanging fruit is really where you need to start. Um, particularly because, uh, as you mentioned, uh, and it was mentioned often yesterday, w that there isn't enough talent within within the government it, that, that have experience. And this is an area where we can get people to have experience, current employees, to try different different projects, be on different pilots where they would get AI experience and feel more comfortable in that area and then expand their skills. So I think from, you know, in terms of developing the talent and in terms of making it easier for the longer term, um, do you, you need to start with the small stuff with keeping in mind a bigger, a bigger goal so that you're all driving in the same direction but that at least you're, you're managing and putting the platform in pla place and the the um, uh, the foundation in place for for future AI use. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? Um, so uh, I, I wanted to come back to a comment actually Jackie you had made this one about um, the negative perceptions around AI um, and maybe uh, Fiona I'll go to you for this question. Um, I'd be curious again, kind of making the comparison between you know the internet era and, and AI. And I would say that there's much more negativity associated with AI than there was, kind of versus the the optimism, the early optimism around the internet when a lot of the policy was being set. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, how you think. Um, I, I guess you could ask either way. You know, how you think if if we would have had that level of pessimism or fear associated with the internet. Um, when you were trying to make policy in that space, how you think that would have shaped it or, or kind of vice versa? Um, do we need to get more optimism around AI and the public uh, to be successful in making policy now? I think the more people can understand, first of all, what is AI and is there a single definition and people can argue about that, like they argue about everything else. But the more people understand, I think the easier it is. Um, I will say in the European context, um, as we were over there the last couple of years at an event recently, um, there was um, there's definitely more of a fear, I would say, in Europe than I'd seen in the United States. But I don't know that it's AI specific. I, I think the European ethos is I've never seen a problem I can't regulate before it happens. And in Europe and in the U.S., it's much more of a let me see if there's a problem and then I'll try to fix it if I can. So, I mean, either both approaches have their pros and cons. So I think the, the, the theory is different. I am curious, though, on, on you guys' report on the on the China issue and the idea that adoption in China is higher. And, and, and as this conversation has unfolded, the idea that people in China trust AI more. And that gives me a little bit of pause. I just wonder if they have a choice about whether they use it or not. Um, and maybe that's why the adoption is so high, um, because there is no expectation of privacy or there these these things culturally just don't, don't exist there. So I think that would be interesting to kind of delve in a little bit. But I do think that, um, you know, in the United States, um, I just don't let people think about it as much. So I think if you can educate people, if you can start talking about it, the more you can make it a part of conversation, then it becomes, I guess, um, more involved. I mean, many people probably don't realize how much of their life is AI is involved in it already, right? I mean, right. so if you don't if you don't talk sure. about it, you don't know it. So then you don't know that it's a good thing. You don't know that you're benefiting from it. So maybe even some general education on that could be good. But I am curious on the China point because the idea that China is ahead in adoption and data. I'm just not sure that people there have a choice in the same way that you do in Western cultures. So. so, yeah, if you look at the uh, surveys and to get an idea of what Chinese people think of artificial intelligence versus uh, the United States and certain Western European 
um, countries, it's, it's really interesting because in some ways China has both the most optimistic and pessimistic views. So Chinese, Chinese people believed that the highest rates that their jobs would no longer exist in 10 years. Um, they believed AI would increase inequality. Um, yet at the same time, they believed AI would create more jobs, would create more wealth, would make them, uh, would help them do their job and make their lives easier. So I think that's ultimately where you start to see some of the um, possibly higher adoption rates because it is interesting when you say if you compare the U.S., China, and EU on adoption, and then you compare them on just their overall positivity about um, AI as a technology, you really see those two mirror each other. So on adoption and piloting AI technologies, you see a, a fairly sizable gap right now between the United States and China, which is China number one, the United States, and then a smaller gap between the United States and the European Union. And that really mirrors the views where Chinese people have the most optimistic views of AI. Um, US, um, US citizens are not as optimistic. And then there's another gap, which I think Fiona mentioned um, from the regulate, regulation standpoint, even between the United States and uh, the European Union. So I do think that um, there's sometimes a I guess a caricature of Chinese people where they um, maybe don't are only optimistic about AI, but I think there is starting to be a conversation there in terms of AI ethics and privacy rights that are happening in China. China, but at the same time, I think um, at least from what I've read, people discuss this more as a techno utilitarian culture that can see the benefits of AI, even if there are some concerns. Um, I was going to just mention too. There, there was a, the Ford Global Trends Survey. Um, one of the things that was interesting about that report is that there were um, at least a couple of years worth where you could see the uh, for China the they they changed the questions each year, but it was generally a question around how much do you trust AI, and the numbers dropped some over time, as you would expect with any kind of optimism curve. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Also, we found when we did some surveys in December in the U.S. Um, that there's a clear gender gap um, in terms of optimism about AI. Um, and we saw in another survey that there's also a clear gender gap in terms of uh, men say they know what AI is at higher rates than women, so which partially AI probably explains. <laughs> uh, so uh, men trust AI more than women, or put differently, uh, women were less optimistic about AI, men were more optimistic. I think there's also a relationship to, if you just take the federal government, if you go back to when we were going to bring in mobility solutions into the federal government, there was all kinds of concerns about, you know, mobility devices. And and we look at these these technology trends as kind of waves, and that was like a technology wave. The cloud wave followed, right? And then there was all there was even more uncertainty relative to the cloud, and it was mostly around security. Yeah. Right. But the side the the amount of concern that was related to security I think was related to the size of the wave, which is it was a transformational. Um, it was very transformational with respect to the enterprise and the federal government. So now here comes this AI thing, and there's fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's related to change, and it's and I think it's proportional to the size of the wave because the AI transformation that's underway is is larger than all the prior waves that came before it combined. Yeah. So I think it's largely aligned, but it's something that has to be dealt with. And I think there's all kinds of work that, that the government, like the, the, the Defense Innovation Board, uh, or somewhere in the DOD, I don't recall, just opened a job for an AI ethicist, mm -hmm. right? And the DIB has been in, I, I don't, I lost track, but uh, here in DC and, and, and Carnegie Mellon, maybe Boston and the Valley, have been listening, you know, conversations to, to try to understand you know, the concerns so that they can then figure out how to do outreach in a meaningful way, so. Right. Um, well, I want to open it up to uh, the room. I know we have a lot of people here. I know we also have a lot of people uh, on the live stream. If you're on the live stream, again, if you use the hashtag data innovation, um, please feel free to send that in. Uh, we'll sign the room and uh, hold on, sorry. I have one right here and then I'll come to this side because I know I've been looking this way for most of the time, so. Oh, and, okay, so we have right here, and then we'll come over here. Uh, thank you, uh, Katie Wang with NTD TV. Um, because uh, our uh, speakers, panelists have talked about uh, this AI is global, is across different sectors, um, but many technologies can also be dual used, like uh, for diff maybe for military or some for civilian, but 
may be do used. Uh, we know that like uh, uh, Google, when they have this AI uh, research center in China, that raised a lot of concern about the national security. Um, the Defense Department concerned that uh, the technology could be used by PLA directly or indirectly. So I'm just wondering uh, how can we address this national security concern uh, when we have this research developed uh, or cooperation with some other countries? Would like to take that one? <laughs> Would that be you? I, I, I don't work for the government anymore, so um, it, it's um, I, I don't work for the government anymore, so it's hard to answer that question. But I will say it's not a new question, right? So it's a question that's been addressed as other technologies have developed. So obviously, there's got to be some lessons learned in the past that could be applied, and these issues could be hopefully be overcome so people can work together. I think would be my sort of generic answer to that one. Mark in the back. So thanks. Um, it's Mark McCarthy with Georgetown, a great panel. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question about regulatory approaches to AI, N not the abstract ethical questions, but what agencies are doing concretely in the area. I know some of the things, uh, CFPB is working on some in the area of financial products and the financial regulators are thinking about AI as part of the enforcement against money laundering. You just heard about the export controls from the Commerce Department. Um, HUD is looking at it in the context of disparate impact and, and the revisions there. But is anyone sort of paying attention to this whole stream of regulatory efforts? Uh, I know Michael Kratzios mentioned that there was going to be an issue of a, a memorandum issued by OMB on the topic to provide guidance in that area, but I, I haven't seen it. Has anybody got any comments about that issue of regulatory approaches to AI? So, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, I know at least within the FDA, they've been looking at how they can actually, um, you know, simplify, I guess, the use of machine learning um, medical devices. So, you know, under prior rules or old FDA rules, you know, each time a machine learning device might have to update itself to improve, um, it might have to go again, undergo approval again. So I know that the FDA is um, trying to, you know, trying to work to certify certain manufacturers or developers of algorithms so that they don't have to go through that whole process each time a device updates itself, and then also the public can have, um, you know, the benefit of a more accurate device. Mark, hi, it's Frank. Um, uh, I, that, that, that's a, a really great question. Uh, you know, one um, uh, aspect of this that, that, that I've long contemplated um, and, and maybe overdue is how do you know, existing regulatory approaches uh, that were uh, implemented prior to this evolution that we've seen in AI, how, how does it apply? And, and it could just be want for Congress and the regulators just didn't contemplate the existing, you know, there's nothing wrong with the existing technology, but that's where I think, I think we'll see more instances as the technology is adopted uh, where existing regulations may bump up against, they, they just need to be updated for, for lack of a better word. And, or there might be some instances where it's, oh my gosh, this is, we're breaking new ground, we really need to take a strong look at the implications of the use of this technology and then decide whether or not a regulatory approach is, is needed or not. Right. Right. Uh, just if I can answer, just one of the things. So, I, I know NIST is looking at at, um, at some regulatory and standards that that I think are really necessary. Um, and one of the things that when when we put out our paper regarding removing barriers, that you know the real discussion is let's look at regulations that that are currently creating issues or don't don't have it contemplated. And I think actually even criminal law, if you look at criminal anything that you could do as a person. <clears throat> and have criminal liability, um, a, a machine doing that same activity should have criminal liability. And how does that criminal liability flow through to, you know, to the person actually creating the algorithm that's, that's doing that activity, right? And those things, I, even in that space, you need to, that needs to be taken a look at and that still hasn't really, really been done. But I, I, we always support legislation. We support the Jobs Act, which talks about a study. I think so much of what really needs to happen now when you talk about the, the lack of trust and the lack of knowledge of what AI is, are study, government studies that are you know, funded and, and um, well-researched and well-respected that are going to create the language, create the right um, the right terminology so that we can all start talking from, from, from the same you know, sheet. And we all have 
proof of what the, the actual challenges are. Because at this point, given the breadth and the scope of AI, we're guessing where the real challenges are. We're guessing at the, the industries that are going to be most impacted. So we really need more studies and more thought process. If nothing else, even if these studies are outdated in, in two months, just to set the, the right terminology and to set the right tone. and I have a very similar question. Um, we've been watching very closely, I guess, um, this process. I think ECRA last year mandated that um, the Commerce Department develop the emerging technology and the foundational rulemaking. And at an event in July, they kind of talked about three buckets, which were quantum AI and uh, I think 3D printing without actually, it, it sort of felt like tacitly they were saying this is what we're going to regulate first without actually saying it. And I was just wondering, you know, I guess it, the legislation was signed in August. It's been about a year. You know, what you guys see as how the process has been going, um, what you expect to it to end up uh, yielding in terms of regulation, and um, I guess how you think they're doing that sort of tough job of balancing the importance of you know fostering American innovation and allowing for access to markets in China, but also not you know allowing I guess adverse adversaries to get access to U.S. technology. <laughs> that, 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 that one's a little outside of my bailiwick. Okay. Any others want to comment on that one? I got it. I just recently got a headache. <laughs> 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 Not from your question. <laughs> Well, I guess, you know, I, I'm sorry. Can I get a little bit more clarification on, on the question itself? So I'm a little bit all over the place. Is my answer. The question is just um, <laughs> what you expect the regulatory process to yield on that rulemaking, the emerging technologies rulemaking, um, and how you see it working so far, like the process. So I, I want to clarify the question, too. So are you talking about the on the export control, or are you talking yeah, about in the executive order? Okay. I right, just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page. Great. So the export control... Uh, rulemaking that possibly yeah. would include AI. That's outside of my <laughs> that's outside of my scope. I'm sorry on the oh. export controls. So, Although generally, right, our, our our I have yet to see uh, you know regulation that I that we feel you know makes sense. I, I we do feel and I, you know and I, I say this all the time. Intel does feel like there is going to there needs to be regulation on AI and it needs to be a little bit more proactive than we have been in past technologies. Just because, again, the scope and, and, and the breadth of AI. Um, but what we need is thoughtful, right? Thoughtful. And, and what we also need is, is sort of people making regulations that are visionaries in terms of, you know, this, this technology that you're currently concerned about and regulating today also has good uses, a dual use problem, right? Where you have really good uses. So how do you make those fine distinctions? And we haven't seen anybody talk about it or do it from a regulatory standpoint in a good way that we feel comfortable with. Um, and so that's the, that's the real challenge that we have with a lot of the, of the regulatory language and, and discussions that we've seen. So that's all, that's about all I can. I'll just <laughs> I'll, I'll add on to that the fact that you know I, I think it's very similar to encryption where you know when we had this debate in the 90s the point was encryption is going to be embedded in every single technology that the U.S. exports. Mm -hmm. It's not just encryption companies. It's every technology, and AI is going to be embedded in every technology that we're exporting in the future. So we can't limit that across the board. Um, you know, there might be some countries that we simply aren't exporting to in general, but I don't think we're going to be able to draw a line in that area. I don't think we should. If we do, we're going to be cutting off U.S. companies from being able to export to those areas, and that's something um, from our, our analysis, you know, we've been very clear on. Um, that policy needs to be right, that U.S. companies should be able to sell globally, and we want to increase that market access. There's a question over, a couple questions over here, and then we'll come back in here. Uh, first in the left. Dirk Hagen with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation here in Washington. I had a couple of questions on China. Um, do you see indication that there is uh, the Chinese government is passing on open data to businesses? Um, do you know about that? And um, is there any U.S. talent going to China to work there? And what R&D spending does uh, China have in the in the area? 
So um, on the open data front, um, I know a couple of years ago, I think in 2016, China, the Chinese government named open data as one of its 10 national projects. Um, despite that, and I think and despite some progress by you know, local cities or local governments, um, it's still severely behind most Western nations in terms of an open data culture. Um, then as far as, what was your second question? So the data that I've seen that goes up to about 2017 has seen very little talent, certainly talent that was born in the United States moving um, from the U.S. to China. Obviously China has its That Thousand Talents program and I know it's recruited um, back at least a couple of hundred uh, computer scientists um, through that program. I'm not sure if they're specifically AI related or just computer scientists in general. And then from an, an AI R&D perspective, I think uh, Michael Kratzios kind of spoke to this a little bit, where there's, it's really difficult to find out how much uh, the Chinese government is actually spending on AI R&D, um, because they often lump things together, such as funding levels, some of it which may be for AI R&D, some of it just for funding for a AI startups. Um, they have something in China called the local government guidance funds, where local governments, um, you know, combined actually have billions of dollars to invest in AI startups. Um, they can do that, you know, with a lot of latitude. So certainly that's not something that we have necessarily here in the U.S. But so the really only way we could compare directly with China is if you look at, say, you know, software and computer services firms, the firms that are most likely to spend um, a large, ch a decent chunk of their R&D on AI and see how they compare. So if you look at, say, like the top 100 firms in the world for doing that, I think 62 of them are in the United States, 12 or 13 are in China, and 12 or 13 are in the U European Union. And I think that goes back to that number that Michael Kratz just mentioned, where US R&D spending by like, these tech firms is about six times higher than Chinese firms. Um, so it's difficult to get an exact idea, but what the data does sh um, indicate, or at least portrays, that the US likely leads from a private standpoint um, by a decent margin. Thanks. Right here, and then we'll go right here. Right, uh, yes. Tony Samp, Tony Samp with DLA Piper. I um, uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, in the panel. Uh, one of the points that Jackie mentioned, the positive narrative about AI, I think that's a, a great point. I think it's something that needs to be reinforced. And if any of you have uh, practical examples of AI that can be most beneficial, I think. That helps tell the story and, and, and uh, helps the overall cause of AI. Uh, so two-part question, that one. The first and then the second, if there's a lot of calls for additional uh, federal funding in AI, uh, in what areas specifically do you think uh, would benefit most? It, it seems that with the potential backlash and concerns about privacy, ethics, uh, facial recognition, some calls for even outright bans in that area, it might be beneficial for uh, an accuracy and explainability. Uh, two suggestions there, but I'd be curious the panel's thoughts on those two. Michael, do you want to take that? Um, so can you just, which question would you like, yeah, like to answer first there? <laughs> Why don't you take the facial recognition one? Um, so from a facial recognition standpoint, actually there was a somewhat encouraging development just this week where I think was at Pew Research Center came out with a survey that actually said that 56% of U.S. citizens were, um, were okay with the police using facial recognition as long as there were guardrails. Unfortunately, you know, there was a lower, um, I guess, acceptance of that use by a mi certain minority groups. But certainly what we've argued is, is that cities such as San Francisco or, or Oakland, um, when they ban the technology, they ban the actual benefits of using the technology. So we already know that um, police departments around the United States have used facial recognition to find um, victims of human sex trafficking online, to find missing children. Um, so I think those are clear benefits that we've already had that they're going to lose. Um, then right now in California, there's actually a bill called uh, AB 1215 that would ban the use of facial recognition and body cameras. Now, I think we're for putting some guardrails about how long they can have that data, who they can scan faces, what the database they can scan against. But by banning that, you're banning the, you know, the excuse me, the benefits of using that, say, at large public events to possibly identify, quickly identify people that may be on a watch list or something like that. So I think one concern within the United States is if we move towards a more precautionary principle, European style of regulation, where we try to, or we try to ban anything that could possibly have a negative use. Um, so we have uh, one more question there and, and one right here. Take them both. 
So we have a question from the live stream. Um, it comes from Joshua Brustein from Bloomberg, and he has two quick questions related to recruiting foreign-born talent. One is whether the pending reclassification of certain AI-related technologies as emerging technologies could or already is making it harder for U.S. companies to secure the foreign-born talent they need to develop this AI. And then related, if the administration's tightened interpretation of deemed export rules, which makes it trickier for um, companies to hire foreign-born workers, is already having that effect. And then if you can, we'll take this question, and then we'll do responses for the last, right here. Good morning, thank you for a great panel. I'm Margaret Cope, independent consultant. Uh, my question has to do with um, talent management and talent, acquiring good talent. Um, is it time to consider a voluntary national service program for young people 18 to 26? In Israel, um, their country has gone from pretty non-distinct um, in cybersecurity to being one of the top five in the world. Um, and they've stated that that was enabled by national service. Um, that's just, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So uh, we have basically three questions on the table about talent, um, access to talent, and uh, training talent and, and through voluntary uh, service, national service. Um, any comments on those three? I know that there's been some uh, regulation. Um, um, Senator, no, Congressman Hurd uh, put out some regulation with regards to doing sort of a, a service corps uh, and cyber. Uh, and I actually think that that's a great idea and that that, that should move forward. Um, I don't know about a mandatory one. That's not sort of that's not yeah they, yeah voluntary. So for a voluntary one, we we completely support that and we think that's a great idea and that's a great way to get um, also the the government get get the sort of cross pollination that they need um, and and the talent that they need and maybe some places where they can't afford the talent or can't can't recruit the talent. Um, I can't remember the other. Two so questions. just in terms of the um, designation, um, uh, in terms uh, of you know being able to get foreign talent, um, any challenges there? The company yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, all of these things hurt, right? And, yeah. and you know, the, our, our immigration um, landscape right now is, is really hurting us in, in, in being able to recruit, maintain, and you know, if, if honestly, if you're an immigrant, I certainly I don't know that I would choose to come here. I'd go to I'd go to Canada. It's much friendlier, and I you know we've heard that, um, and we've lost talent that way. So it, you know, yeah, it, it, it hurts and it, and it causes problems and it causes challenge with how you put your workforce and how you use your workforce. And I know Microsoft does. Yes. Yeah. I, I I concur with those, those <laughs> comments. I mean, certainly, uh, attracting good talent uh, from around the world is 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 important. Um, and again, not just for our companies, but but for others as well. And certainly, we don't we want to see it done in a in a, in a right way, um, but in a way that doesn't close off the, the the ability to recruit good talent. I'll just mention the partnership on AI, which I believe Microsoft and, and some of the other companies are a part of uh, here. Intel as well um, just released a paper today um, looking at the issue around visas and um, allowing talent to go to conferences, to work for companies, to bring their families, and they're seeing that as a consistent problem as well. Um, well, thank you uh, to my panel for being here today. Please join me in thanking them for that. Um, I also want to just flag real quick, we are doing another event in one week um, around data-driven uh, drug development. So if you're interested in this same type of discussion, but specifically in the uh, medicine field, we encourage you to sign up for that on our website. But please join me in thanking our panelists, and thanks to you for being here today. Thank you.